Welcome you to City of God this morning. Uh, if you're new with us, I'm Eric. I'm one of the pastors here. Great to have you with us. Be in John 15 today. So if you want to go ahead and turn there, uh, we're going to be in John 15. While you're turning there, I've been really encouraged lately uh, just on the feedback I've received on the first half of this series uh, called The Five Affirmations, where we're looking at our goal as a church to become people who progressively look more like Jesus, who are disciples of Jesus. That when we look in Scripture, we see that God's will for our lives. Everyone's asking, what's God's will for my life? We know that one of His wills for us is this, that we would look more like Christ. To think like Jesus, to live like Jesus, to love like Jesus. And in order for that transformation to take place, for us to change, two things have to happen. First, as we've talked about, God has to do a supernatural work in each of us. That these aren't, or we can't experience real and lasting spiritual change unless God does that work inside of us. However, while that transformation is God's work, we've been saying there's still a role for us to play in looking more like Christ and becoming the people that God has called us to be. Because there's ways we can put ourselves in the best possible situation to experience more of God's power and presence, to allow Him to do a greater work in us. And that's where these five affirmations come into play. Then as a leadership team, we began asking the question, if someone's going to follow Jesus, what is most important for them to know, to believe, to do? And we settled on these five things two weeks ago. We looked at the first affirmation, which was this. We want everyone who calls City of God home to be able to affirm, I am loved. Primarily, I am loved by God, that because of what Jesus has done by dying on the cross for my sins, raising from the dead, adopting me into the family of God, that I can know if I believe in Jesus, I am loved by God. And we didn't earn that love or deserve that love. It was a gift that God has given us because of what Christ has done. And since we didn't earn that love, it's not a transactional thing. I behave and then God loves me. I obey and then God loves me. No, it's a love we can be secure in and can rest in because it is a love that Christ has given us. And so we can find our value and our worth and our identity in this life, in this love. Last week we looked at the second affirmation, which is I am known, as Pastor TJ just mentioned. In particular, I'm known by the people around me, that we want everyone at City of God to have meaningful relationships with other Christians, where one of the goals of these relationships is moving closer to Jesus together, and we're trying to create some more spaces for that to happen naturally. And having an understanding that God loves me and having real relationships with other believers, just those two pieces will really get you down the road in terms of spiritual progress, but they also lead naturally into the third affirmation, which is the one we're looking at today. We want everyone who calls City of God home to be able to affirm this, I am growing. Growing is the third one. I know that God's will for me is to look more like Jesus, and when I look back on my life, I can see the transformation that's taken place. I can see the changes that have come into my life since I made the decision to follow Jesus. And not saying that you're perfect, not saying you don't still have a long way to go, but that there are pieces of evidence that God is changing me and shaping me, and we should expect this as Christians, because living things grow and healthy things grow. And in John 15, this is the assumption that Jesus has of his disciples. If you follow me, you will grow. That's the point of John 15. And so as we open this passage of Scripture, it's the night before Jesus goes to the cross, and he's basically giving his disciples a framework for when I'm gone, after my death and resurrection, when I return to the Father, what should your life with me look like? We have John 15. So we read verses 1 and 2. I'm the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. Jesus uses this imagery of a vine and its branches to talk about our life with him. And anyone who heard Jesus' teaching and was familiar with the Old Testament would have understood this language. 
Because throughout the Old Testament, Israel is often described as God's vine that people had to be connected to. But Jesus says here, no, no, I am the vine. I am the one you have to be connected to to experience life with God. And from the outset, we see one of Jesus' goals for each of us. He wants us to bear fruit. That's what we're talking about this morning. If we're connected to Christ, we will bear fruit. That's the promise of John 15. And this idea of bearing fruit is simply another way of describing that transformation into the image of Jesus we want to experience. And Jesus lays out two scenarios here. Either a branch will not bear fruit, in which case it's taken away, he says at the beginning of verse 1, or it will bear fruit, and God will prune that branch so it can be even more fruitful, because the goal is fruitfulness. And the main point of this teaching isn't difficult to see. Uh, New Testament scholar D.A. Carson puts it this way, there are no true Christians without some measure of fruit in their lives. This is the implication of John 15. There's no true Christians without some measure of fruit in their lives. It's impossible to be connected to Jesus and not produce fruit or not change. And from the outset, this forces us to ask a difficult question. If you're someone who claims to be a Christian, are you seeing fruit produced in your life from your relationship with Christ? Now, in just a moment, we'll discuss what that fruit might be because maybe you're thinking, I don't know if I, what, what kind of fruit should I see in my life? But if you think about your life and you can't point to any real change that has occurred since you made the decision to follow Jesus, John 15 would be like a, a flashing warning sign to us, something has gone wrong here. Now, to be clear, even the most faithful Christian is going to have ups and downs in the spiritual life. There are going to be times in season when things are going well, and it seems like we're progressing quickly, but there's also going to be times when we feel spiritually stuck, and maybe it doesn't feel like our love for Christ is growing. Maybe it doesn't feel like we're seeing a lot of changes, and, and it's because this is a time when God has to do some of that pruning work in us. Or, and we've got to be honest with ourselves here, Maybe we made a decision to follow Christ in the past because we wanted to know that we would go to heaven when we die, but there was no expectation that a decision to follow Jesus would change anything about the life that I'm currently living on this earth. And what you discover as you read John 15, though, is this. That's not the kind of life Jesus is inviting us into. Let me take care of your future. Do whatever you want in the present. No, he's saying, live with me in the present and in the future and allow me to produce fruit in you now and forever as you stay connected to me. Now, the question is, but how does Christ work that change in us? How do we produce the kind of fruit he's describing here? Honestly, it's a lot simpler than we realize, but it is difficult to live out. Verse 4, Jesus tells the disciples, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. What is it that produces spiritual fruit in us? We abide in Christ. We remain in him. We stay connected to him. Jesus uses this word abide 10 times in John 14 to 17. It's one of his favorite terms for describing the Christian life. But what does it mean to abide in Jesus? What are we talking about here? It's this idea of we learn to remain connected to him throughout all of our life. He becomes the source of our life, and we draw what we need from him. And as we draw our life from Jesus, it naturally produces this fruit in us. It's interesting that when Jesus talks about how do we grow spiritually, his focus is on abiding in him. He says, focus on abiding in me and the fruit will take care of itself. But this is often the opposite of how we approach spiritual growth in our own lives. That I can think of seasons when I wanted to start taking my faith seriously. I wanted to mature as a Christian. And so what I began to focus on was doing the kinds of things mature Christians were supposed to do. Mimicking the behavior of people who were spiritually mature. And that seems like the right thing to do. But Jesus uh, nuances this in a really important way here. 
He says, if you want to grow, focus on abiding in me. And if you will focus on abiding in me, the transformation will take care of itself. You will be changed. You will produce fruit. But if we focus on changing our behavior without learning to abide in Christ, then we'll get to this place where our way of life or what people see on the outside won't match the reality of who we are on the inside or the quality of our relationship with Jesus, and we won't be able to sustain that kind of life. The author Paul Tripp has a helpful illustration of how most Christians pursue spiritual growth. He writes, let's say I have an apple tree in my backyard. Each year its apples are dry, wrinkled, brown, and pulpy, and after several seasons my wife says it doesn't make any sense to have this huge tree and never be able to eat any of the apples. Can we do something? One day my wife looks out the window and sees me in the yard carrying branch cutters, an industrial grade stapler gun, a ladder, and two bushes of apples. I climb the ladder, cut off all the pulpy apples, and staple shiny red apples onto every branch of the tree. From a distance, our tree looks like, like it's full of a beautiful harvest, but if you were my wife, what would you be thinking at this moment? If a tree produced bad apples year after year, there's something drastically wrong with its system down to its very roots. I won't solve the problem by stapling new apples onto the branches. They also will rot because they're not attached to a life-giving root system. And next spring, I'll have the same problem again. I will not see a new crop of healthy apples because my solution has not gotten to the heart of the problem. If a tree's roots remain unchanged, it will never produce good apples. He writes, the point is much of what we do to produce growth and change in ourselves and others is really little more than fruit stapling. It attempts to exchange apples for apples without examining the heart, the root behind the behavior. This is the very thing for which Christ criticized the Pharisees. Change that ignores the heart will seldom transform life. For a while, it may seem like the real thing, but it will prove temporary and cosmetic. One of the things I had to recognize at some point about my own life is this is how I was pursuing spiritual growth. Again, I knew what a spiritually mature person was supposed to look like, and so I started trying to look like that person without going any deeper to assess where is my life with Christ? What is going on inside of me that leads to me living in the way that I'm living? And inevitably, those changes never stuck. Maybe you've tried to change and you find yourself falling back into habits and rhythms and practices as you've always done them. And this will continue to happen if we ignore the heart because inevitably we will always default back to acting like the person we truly are on the inside. We can't help it. We can only fake it for so long. And so Jesus is trying to help us in John 15, if you want to produce fruit, fruit that will last, fruit that is genuine and authentic, focus on abiding in me, not the behavior that should come with it, and the behavior will come. But how do we do that? Now, before answering that question, it might be helpful to define what kind of fruit is Jesus describing here? If I'm supposed to produce fruit, what should I be producing? Jesus answers some of this for us down in verse 10 when he says, If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. One of the clearest pieces of evidence that we're growing spiritually, that our hearts are being changed, or that we're producing fruit is there is a growing desire to obey Jesus' commands inside of us. Those Christians who are being transformed into the image of Christ have a desire to obey Christ. They want to know His Word. They want to know His teaching. They want to bring their lives in alignment with, what, with His will for their lives. But that's not the only kind of fruit we see described in the Bible. If we're producing fruit, not only will we be increasingly obedient to Jesus, but we'll also begin to see some significant changes to our character. This is one of the ways that Paul describes the fruit of the Christian life when he writes in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. 
and so these are some of the fruit we should expect to see in the life of someone who's abiding in Christ or living life in the Spirit in Paul's words. The funny thing is, when most people are trying to determine if they're growing spiritually, what do they typically look at? Am I doing the kinds of things a Christian is supposed to do? Am I going to church? Am I reading my Bible? Am I serving? Am I praying before meals? Whatever it is that believers do. And just to be clear, none of these are bad things. But what Paul and Jesus are trying to alert us to is this. It's possible to do a lot of spiritual activity and remain unchanged on the inside. Who hasn't encountered, or if you're being honest, and I have to at some points, maybe you've experienced this yourself, some significant gap between what you claim to believe and what you show people on the outside and what you're actually experiencing on the inside. If we take Paul's fruit of the Spirit as an example, how many of us have encountered someone who call themselves a Christian and who does a lot of Christian stuff, and yet they're always really angry, or they don't have a lot of joy in their life, or they're not patient or kind, they're not self-controlled, they're not gentle, they're not loving. And there seems to be this massive disconnect between who they say they are in their religious activity and who they appear to be on the inside as you get to know them a little better. Now, just to be clear, no Christian is going to be perfect, and we're all going to struggle. But if there's a glaring lack of the kind of fruit that both Jesus and Paul describe here, something has gone wrong in our Christian life. Something has gone wrong in our discipleship. In a really honest moment, do you feel like maybe this is true of your own life? Do you feel like the people around you might struggle with what you profess to believe and who you actually are? I know I've had that experience around people as they interact with me. And again, it's not a fun question to ask, but John 15 and Galatians 5 force us to ask, as a Christian, do I see the fruit of obedience to Jesus in my life? As a Christian, do I see the fruit of changed character in my life? Can I see the progression And if not, what can I do to change that? Or even if I am seeing fruit, what can I do to see more fruit produced in my life? And this is where, again, John 15 gives us the answer. It's simple, but not necessarily easy to live out. Because, again, Jesus tells us repeatedly, this is where fruit comes from. Abide with me. Look at all that Jesus promises for the one who abides him in John 15. I'll just do this quickly. Verse 4, abide in me so that you can bear much fruit. Verse 5, whoever abides in me bears much fruit. Verse 7, if you abide in me, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Verse 9, abide in my love. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Over and over this encouragement, abide in me, stay close to me, draw your life from me. And so the obvious question is, but what does it look like to abide in Christ for us today? How can we take advantage of what Jesus seems to be offering us here? Once again, Carson writes in his commentary on John, abiding in Christ looks like continuous dependence on him, constant reliance upon him, persistent spiritual imbibing of his life, this is the essential condition of the Christian life. The Christian who merely mimics Christian conduct and witness, but is not impelled by life within, brings forth dead crystals, not fruit. There's a couple of phrases he uses here to describe this abiding. Again, continuous dependence, constant reliance. At its core, it seems as if abiding in Christ involves becoming aware of Christ's presence with us and in us and learning to grow in our ability to recognize that Jesus is with us and to depend on him for everything that we need, to live life with Jesus constantly and continually. And this is possible for us because one of the most incredible promises that Jesus ever gave us and one of the truths, if we're being honest, we're most prone to forget is that through the indwelling Holy Spirit that Christ has given to every believer, Jesus is always present with us in a real way in the life of everyone who calls themselves a believer. 
Back a little earlier in John's Gospel, John 14, 16 to 17, Jesus promised, and I'll ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. If you have put your hope and trust in Jesus, you have the indwelling Holy Spirit, meaning God is always present with you. He's always inside of you. He's always available to you whenever you need him. And it's our ability to remember this and to press into this and to learn to live life from this reality that is the secret of our abiding in Him. We want to get to a place where wherever we are and whatever we're doing, we're cognizant of the presence of Jesus and we're mindful of Him to some degree. We want to get to a place where we can affirm along with the 17th century Christian Brother Lawrence, which if you've never read his Practice of the Presence of God, it's an incredibly helpful book. But he writes this about his own relationship with Jesus. He got to a point where the time of busyness does not with me differ from the time of prayer. And in the noise and clatter of my kitchen, while several persons are at the same time calling for different things, I possess God in as great tranquility as if I were upon my knees before Him. But how do we get there? How do we begin to live our lives like that? And the truth is, we can't get to a place where we're abiding in Christ throughout all of our days unless we're training ourselves to abide with Christ at specific moments and in specific ways. What's the path to spiritual growth? How do we produce fruit that will last? We abide in Jesus all of the time. But learning to abide in Christ all of the time means we first have to learn to abide in Christ in small ways and at specific times to begin to train our hearts and train our minds to be mindful of the presence of Jesus with us always. Because the truth is, here's the the trick to spiritual growth. We will be transformed into the image of Jesus the more we spend time with Him. We get this in our own lives. We naturally become like the people we spend the most time with. The famous actor Denzel Washington once said, if you hang around with five intelligent people, you'll become the sixth. If you hang around with five millionaires, you'll become the sixth. If you hang around with five idiots, you'll become the sixth. And I think you could extend that out to say, and if you hang around with Jesus, you will become more like him. Uh, Still, this language of abiding in Christ or living in his presence might seem confusing. Practically, what does this look like? Again, the truth is, whether it's Christ or something else, we all already have something we're abiding in. We all have something we're rooted and anchored in. We have something that provides kind of our default home in this life. Pastor John Mark Comer is quickly becoming one of my favorite authors and pastors. He wrote The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, which we spent some time on in a sermon series a few years ago. And he recently wrote a book entitled Practicing the Way, Be with Jesus, Become Like Him, Do as He Did, which is a pretty good description of everything we're trying to accomplish in this five affirmation series. And so anything helpful or good in the rest of the sermon probably came from him. But what does it look like? to abide in Christ. On the idea that everyone has something they're already abiding in, he writes helpfully, all of us have a source we're rooted in, a kind of default setting we return to, an emotional home. It's where our minds go when they're not busy with tasks, where our feelings go when we need solace, where our bodies go when we have free time, and where our money goes after we've paid the bills. And this matter because whatever we abide in will determine the fruit of our lives for good or for ill. If we're rooted in the infinite scroll of social media, it will form us, likely into people who are angry, anxious, arrogant, simplistic, and distracted. If we're rooted in the endless queue of our streaming platforms, they will form us, likely into people who are restless, lustful, and bored, never present to what is. If we're rooted in the pursuit of hedonism, another drink, another hookup to take the edge off the pain and let us find a moment's peace, 
that will form us as well, likely into people who are compulsive, addictive, and running from both our pain and our healing. What do you return to in your quiet moments? Where do you find solace and joy? What would it look like for you to make your home with God? What do we abide in? That's a question only we can answer for ourselves. What is shaping and forming us, and how can we begin to make Jesus the person who is forming and shaping us, the one that we're rooted in, our default setting, our eternal home, as he writes here? How can we make Christ the one our minds naturally turn to when they're on autopilot? When you read through the Gospels, Jesus' invitation to the disciples was this, come and follow me. Spend time with me, live with me, learn from me, follow my example. And as the disciples spent time with Jesus, they were changed. They were far from perfect. They make mistakes often in the Gospels, but you see the slow transformation begin to happen in them the more time we spend with Jesus. And in fact, that's something available to us today. It feels more difficult because we can't physically be in the presence of Jesus, but Jesus' presence is actually more available to us today than it was when he walked on this earth with the disciples because again through the indwelling holy spirit christ is present with us and available to us at all times everywhere we go wherever we are how often do we stop to consider this that as we sit here this morning christ is present in each of us who believe That when we wake up, when we're getting ready, when we're sitting in class or at work, when we're going through our days, making dinner, getting ready for bed, Christ is present with us. And again, it's learning to recognize this truth and live out the reality, this reality that is the key to abiding in Christ and producing the spiritual fruit we were meant to produce. It's learning to abide in the presence of Jesus that will allow us to affirm, I am growing because as I spend time with Jesus, I can't help but grow. And it's possible to get to a place where we've trained our minds to know and remember that Christ is with us and to keep our focus on him throughout our days. The Christian author Dallas Willard writes, the first and most basic thing we can do is to keep God before our minds. This is the fundamental secret of caring for our souls. Our part in thus practicing the presence of God is to direct and redirect our minds constantly to Him. In the early time of our practicing, we may well be challenged by our burdensome habits of dwelling on things less than God. But these are habits, not the law of gravity, and they can be broken. A new grace-filled habit will replace the former ones as we take intentional steps toward keeping God before us. Soon our minds will return to God as the needle of a compass constantly returns to the north. If God is the great longing of our souls, He will become the pole star of our inward being. That's a pretty extensive definition, and a much shorter one, A.W. Tozer writes, that the life we're meant to live is this, a life with a constant conscious communion with Jesus. That's the goal. Elsewhere, Willard describes this as the with God life we're seeking to live. And I think to most Christians, that sounds good to get to a place where we can live all of life in constant conscious communion with Jesus. Imagine what life could look like. Imagine the transformation we could experience if that's how we were living. But again, to get to this place where we're conscious of Christ at all times and living with Him at all times, it's going to take us rewiring our hearts and minds, and the only way to do that is to have intentional moments at specific times where we're making ourselves realize the presence of Christ with us and setting our minds on Him. We learn to abide with Christ always as we spend intentional time with the Lord. This is the way to pursue this kind of life. Now, it's at this point I usually tread kind of lightly and pull my punches a little bit with people as we describe this because we're all busy and our calendars are full And there's lots of things going on, and we don't want this to feel like a burden. And so typically the encouragement is this. Here's how you can squeeze a little bit of Jesus into an already overcrowded life. But the longer I'm a pastor and the older I get, the more convinced I am of this fact. Without regular, consistent time in the presence of Jesus, 
We will not abide in him. We will not grow close to him. And we will not be transformed by him. Without regular and consistent time in Jesus' presence, we have no hope of ever getting to the place where we will live all of life in his presence and abide in him continually, which means this is something we're going to have to make time for. If we want to be in the presence of Christ always, we have to be in the presence of Christ at specific times. Whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, young or old, male or female, whatever it is, we have to pursue this. Jesus pursued this in his own life. You read through the Gospels over and over again. Jesus ministers, he's with people, he retreats and he's with the Father. Then he ministers and he's with people and he retreats and he's with the Father over and over and over again. And often the encouragement is this is something we have to create margin for. We have to find space for this in our lives. But as Christians, shouldn't Christ get the first and best of our time and everything else fall in around that? Again, if we're going to abide in Christ, if we're going to draw near to him, we have to start saying no to more and more things so that we can say yes to intentional time with Jesus. This is a struggle for Jesse and me, too. We had a lengthy discussion about our calendar last night where we said we've got to get some control back of this. But as you're sitting here this morning, if you're going to abide in Christ and draw near to him and live life with him, you might have to say no to some things you're saying yes to right now. If you're going to learn to abide in Christ, your life is not going to look like the lives of everyone else who lives around you. Now, every family is different, every person is different, all our energy levels are different, we have different loads that we can carry in this life, but this is what this might mean. It doesn't have to mean this, it might mean, and you need to think about this. If I'm going to have regular and consistent time with Jesus, it might mean I have to let others get ahead of me at work because I'm not going to put the over and above time that they're willing to put in because I'm not going to be defined by my work and I'm going to have space to spend time with Jesus. Parents, and I know this is hard, you might have to watch other kids progress more quickly than your kids in some areas and get opportunities they don't because your kids' activities have left you with no time to cultivate a relationship with Jesus individually or as a family. Students, are you willing to let someone get a little better grade than you in the class Because you're not going to spend so much time studying that you don't have time to spend with Jesus. There's 50 other things we could put in a list like this. You might not get to watch all the shows and stay as current on pop culture as you want. You might not be as good at your hobby as someone else is. You might not make as much money. You might not get as much time with friends as other people. But if you find yourself recoiling at one of those ideas in that list, is it possible that's become an idol in your life? What do you mean I have to give that up or tone that down for Christ? There has to be another way. Pay attention to whatever that is and recognize that's probably what's most important to you right now. One author put it this way, show me a person's habits and I'll show you what they are truly most passionate about, most dedicated to, most willing to suffer for, and most in love with. Again, either we will make time to spend in Jesus' presence or we won't. We'll prioritize this or we won't. But if we won't, which is a decision we can make, we should not expect to make any progress in the spiritual life because the only way we can be transformed into the image of Jesus from the inside out is by spending time with him. Now, this can feel heavy-handed. This can feel like a burden. My to-do list is already full, and you've added another thing. And I want you to recognize that as long as spending time with Jesus is just something on the to-do list, it will be a burden. But how many Christians are living the Christian life, running themselves ragged, doing spiritual things for Jesus, and never enjoying the best part of the Christian life. We get Jesus. We go to all the services, we do all the things, we read all the books, we're we're doing everything we can that we're supposed to do, but we never receive the reward of the Christian life, a relationship with Christ, nearness with Christ, friendship with Christ. And it's only when we see Jesus as the reward we're doing all of these things for in the first place that we'll shift it from something we have to do to the one thing we want to do. 
Now, I've already gone long. The band can come up, and we're going to get ready to do sing. But my guess is some of you are asking, I want to do that. I'd love to do that. I don't know where to start. What do I do? Quickly, you have to make time and space for it. When will you be with Jesus? Put it on your calendar. Say no to things that try and encroach on that time. Start small and be consistent. When is the time that people need you least? Maybe begin to take advantage of that. And mom and dad, I know it's hard with little kids at home. It's hard with so many other things going on. One of the best ways you could serve your spouse is by saying, get out of the house for 20 or 30 minutes. Go be with Jesus. Go hide. Go find somewhere in the house and hide. Because you're going to be a better spouse and a better parent when you're connected to Jesus, and I want to prioritize that for you. And do that in return for each other. Again, when do people need you the least? It might be when you're in a season where you just need to go to bed earlier, watch one less show, go to bed earlier, wake up a little earlier, and spend some time with Jesus. Stay up a little later and spend some time with Jesus. Whatever it is, where can you find regular, consistent time with him? And what does it look like to spend that time with him? When you come to that time, spend some time in silence, quiet in your heart, reminding yourself, I'm in the presence of Jesus. Jesus is with me. The author Henry Nouwen once wrote, without solitude, it is virtually impossible to live a spiritual life, probably even more so in our day with all the distractions around us. What can you do to remember that you're in the presence of Jesus? Again, part of what we're trying to do is train our minds to be cognizant of Jesus with us. I have friends who when they spend this time with Jesus, it might seem silly to some, will set an empty chair in front of them just to remember, Jesus is with me right now. They'll light a candle, nothing mystical or magical about it, just a cue. I'm in the presence of Jesus right now. I'm being mindful of Jesus with me. This time with Jesus will likely involve getting into God's word a little bit, hearing from the word of God. John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. One of the ways we abide in Christ is by getting his word into us to shape us and mold us to be the filter through which we see the world. And so find a Bible reading plan. Ask a spiritually mature Christian, where should I start? Pick a gospel, pick the gospel of Mark, go a paragraph at a time, and ask as you read. Don't just read to check this off a checklist. Be mindful of this. God is speaking to me as I'm reading scripture. Jesus has something for me in this reading, and I'm asking Jesus, what do you want me to see? What do you want me to know? Make this relational abiding in Christ in this way. And if something jumps out at you as you're reading, stop, pray about it. Think about it. Dwell on it. Who cares if you don't finish what's on your checklist? Spend time in the presence of Jesus. This time will also likely involve prayer, where we we silence ourselves to hear from God. We hear from God in his word, but we also cultivate this abiding in prayer. Again, verse 7, if my words abide in you, what's the outflow? Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. We receive from Jesus, and then we pray to Jesus and ask for his help. What you've just told me to do is hard. I'm going to need your help to do this. And again, maybe prayer has always been a struggle. God has given us a manual to teach us to pray. That's what the Psalms are for. The Psalms are the prayers that Jesus prayed. The Psalms are the prayers the disciples prayed. Go to the Lord's Prayer where Jesus teaches his disciples to pray and just pray that. Some people have asked why a city of God started using more written out prayers over the past year. It's because one of the ways that God has always taught people how to pray is by giving them Here's a prayer. Here's something to pray. Here's a model for prayer because in them we find things we wouldn't naturally pray for. Things outside our normal list of requests we make to God. Take a psalm a day and pray through it. Make it your own words to God and see how you begin to grow. And finally, maybe as a part of that time we're doing this, we're simply receiving the truth we've read in Scripture. We're thinking about the promises of God and letting them wash over us in a real way. I'll close with this. David Benner writes, meditating on God's love has done more to increase my love than decades of effort trying to be more loving. Allowing myself to deeply experience his love, taking time to soak in it and allow it to infuse me has begun to affect changes that I had given up hope of ever experiencing. Coming back to God in my failures at love, throwing myself into his arms and asking him to remind me of his love for me, here I begin to experience new levels of love to give to others. 
Again, I know there's a ton of practical ways we could try and unpack this. We need to close. I'd encourage you, maybe pick up that book, Practicing the Way. Again, email one of the pastors. What can I do to begin spending more regular time with Jesus? Ask a mature Christian you know what they do. But even if you're still figuring out what this looks like, here's my goal for today to give us the desire. We want to be with Christ. We want to be in his presence. We want to live life in his presence because it is only in the presence of Jesus that we will be able to affirm I am growing. And if we will commit to living life in the presence of Jesus, just imagine what could happen in your own life and in the life of this body. I'm going to pray and we'll sing.